first, I just want to thank you so much for joining us for our inaugural webinar and discussion forum around Delta Think's popular news and views series. Uh, we're so excited. Uh, we've had such a great response to this, and we really hope that today uh, this will generate a lot of questions and conversation, and the aim is to have it be a high, highly interactive uh, session. Uh, so I'm Lauren Kane, the CEO of Delta Think, and I'd like to introduce today's speakers um, and news and views authors. So we have Ann Michael, founder of Delta Think and chair of the board, uh, as well as chief digital officer at PLOS. Uh, and we have Dan Pollack, uh, chief digital officer of Delta Think, uh, and along with Ann, architect of Delta Think's open access data and analytics tool. Uh, so as I said, Ann joins us from the Philadelphia area and Dan is in London and uh, both have cats that may make an appearance today if, if you're lucky. <laughs> so. Uh, as you said, the format for today is informal and interactive. You'll see our speakers test one another and offer counter opinions, and uh, we welcome that from you as well. So thank you for being here again, and without further ado, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Anne. Great, thanks, Lauren. So um, we thought we would start out with just a little bit of background on uh, what, why we chose this topic and some of the headlines, and then hopefully get into questions because we really do want this to be very interactive. So uh, when thinking about what's happening right now and, and how publishers and researchers and libraries and everyone is being impacted, Dan and I started to think about, well, what does this mean to the environment, like to our publishing ecosystem and particularly to, you know, to the academic scholarly publishing ecosystem? And, you know, and Dan was thinking, well, you know, do we have anything in the past that could help us with this? And as Dan and I discussed it, we kind of thought, well, Yes and no. So this isn't exactly like it was in 2008, but if we could think about variables in the data that we did have that might change over time or might show some kind of relationship to um, you know, economic indicators, that maybe we could even use those to say, well, not so much this is exactly what will happen, but if variable X or Y moves in a certain direction, then maybe that could help us think about what might happen. So, I mean, basically, I think a lot of us, most of us are sitting at home, although this isn't new for me, it's new for a lot of folks. Um, and as you know, us experienced cat owners have our doors closed, so there shouldn't be no visitors coming into this meeting. You know, but this is new to a lot of people and there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of angst. So um, I thought, you know, without further ado, maybe Dan, you can start telling us a little bit about what you think the headlines are. And just so you know, too, Dan and I are going to have a little bit of a conversation, so it may not be uh, un unthinkable that he or I will interrupt each other, but don't worry, we do that all the time. Uh, thanks, Anne. Hello, everyone. So yes, I thought I'd just recap what we found. Uh, and following on from Anne's point, we found writing these news and views pieces, which we've been doing every month for quite a while now, they're a bit of a journey. You often start off with a supposition and you have to find out where the data takes you. And of course, a lot of this is just looking for relationships or patterns. So I have to first caveat everything by saying, you know, there's a difference between correlation and causation. And I think it's the discussion around the causation that, that, that leads to the, the interesting uh, dialogue that I, I hope we have. But just for now, what, what we did in the most recent piece was we really looked for some sort of correlation or relationship between different factors um, out there in the marketplace, sort of general measures of economic activity, and journal market activity and of course journal market activity itself could be defined as volumes of articles or numbers of journals or, or value of the marketplace so the, the headlines we came across having trawled through a whole bunch of data and i'm sure we can get into some of the details of that in a bit um was the number one probably highly surprisingly to people historically the journal market has been very very steady um, and that includes spanning the 2008 downturn i mean sort of barely a blip if you will in in the figures um, it, over the very, very long term, its growth rate has been slowing down very gradually, but, but on the whole, we haven't seen any major disruption. And then as we start to try and compare different economic factors with how the market tracked, really the headlines there were that the two key measures, GDP, so that's gross domestic product, and something called GERD, uh, which is Gross Domestic Expenditure on Research and Development. So that's how much stuff is going into the R&D sector. So GDP and GERD, particularly of the world's major economies, so the, the OECD members plus people like China and Russia, um, really that shows the strongest relationship 
with the number of articles. So basically the more money that's flowing into the system, the more articles that seem to be flowing out of it, if you will. Um, and the other thing that we saw uh, was that the, the total number of workers in research and development, so that's either researchers or ancillary staff, that, that also showed a very strong relationship with both the numbers of articles being produced and also the numbers of journals being produced. And then finally, if you look at the number of researchers, so just a subset of personnel in R&D uh, who call themselves researchers, um, especially in the major economies, that showed a very close relationship with, with the growth in journal market value, so the sort of year-on-year -year change in value of the journals market. Um, so we arrived at those headlines after, after looking at across two dozen or so different measures, that they seem to be the ones that we're tracking. And, and really that relationship updates some work that has been done previously. Again, we can get into the details of that if we want to. Um, so that was the headline of the sort of the data crunching. And then the conclusions we drew in our most recent piece, and I know so is what we'll get into talking about now, logically flow from that data. So having looked at those relationships, what might be causing it, and really a few headlines to get us going, if you will. Uh, number one, um, purely open access models are very dependent on both volumes of articles and throughput. So and actually, now, purely APC-based open yeah, access models. Thank you, and yeah, purely yeah. APC models, other models are available. Um, but, but, but that sort of volume and throughput is, is key if, you know, if you're thinking about the cash flow of, a, of an APC-driven model. So of course, any drops in output are going to have quite an immediate effect on those APC open access revenues. Conversely, of course, subscription reviews have weathered downturns rather well. The subscription model tends to be bought in advance, multi-year deals, and you know, a, a short-term drop in output of article numbers doesn't necessarily lead to, to a fall in subscription revenues. Um, and I think also price pressures are not new in the subscriptions market. However, if we tie the various factors together, and we say, well, if, if, if following the current crisis, the drop in GDP and the drop in numbers of researchers in the system, if that is deep and projected and protracted, then together that could actually begin to have an impact on article volumes and, and, and on, you know, or could have a possible impact on, on the overall economics of the journal marketplace. Um, so that was our headline, Relationships and Conclusions. Um, and I don't know if you want to add anything to those. Uh, quick, yeah, quick data question for you, Dan, from the audience. Yeah. Um, and, and we should say too, as a, a please, uh, you can, your questions can, can be general um, or they can be uh, really testing Dan's uh, data, data knowledge here. And this is one of those. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, is there a discernible uh, lag time in the relationship to GERD? Um, it's a good question. We, we didn't look for that. We, we just plotted the figures out on a chart uh, since about, we actually went back to 1996, where we, we started tracking everything from 2000. Um, and you, you find as one grows, the other grows in very close concert. Um, but I would, oh, go on, sorry, Dan. No, go, go on now. No, I was going to say, the, but the, the, another interesting part about that too, though, is that there is definitely a lag time when it comes to funding. So like one of the things we talked about is when you start to look at all of these countries that are coming up with mechanisms to help their people, to help their companies, um, that money is gonna have to come from somewhere. And if it comes from research funding, except for potentially you know, disease related topics around this disease or epidemiology or you know, computational, I mean, but it, if, it, if it narrows in scope and specialties are left with lower budgets, it usually it takes about two years for that to impact the actual, you know, the, the output from a or from a publisher's or you know a scholarly, um, you know, academic publishing perspective. So the publishers, like right now, people's grants are locked in, and a lot of a lot of them are being extended. So they're recognizing that you know they might need six more months to finish up their research. But overall, like I think what Dan was saying is that when it comes to the number of people performing research, we have people that are locked out of labs. We don't know how long that's going to be. Um, and then one interesting point, uh, in, in, uh, anecdotally, I've spoken to about a dozen different publishers. And in the short term, they're all seeing increases in submissions, although not necessarily always the highest quality of submissions. 
Um, so it, it's, you know, it seems as though while people are kind of home thinking about what's happening, they're also cleaning out their drawers and getting through the research that maybe they haven't had time to write up. But, um, but that's a great question. Like I said, you know, from, a, from a funding perspective, there is definitely a delay. So I think one thing we should think about is regardless of how things happen over the next six months, we may very well see two years from now, if funding changes take place, we might see a change. Yeah. And, and then perhaps one thing to add to that is the multi-year nature of funding settlements and the deal. So um, we, we did some work looking at uh, US government funding in certain specialties going back a few years. And we noticed an interesting thing that funding going into the system, especially into life sciences, continued to increase after the 2008 downturn for two or three years. It was only a, two or three years after that you saw a fall back in funding. But in some ways that was then spread out. You didn't see a massive drop off in papers. So yeah. I, I wonder if, if, if some of this could be, you know, if people know these cuts are coming down the pipeline, they might start to make plans. Uh, universities might start to make plans, for example, to dip into contingency budgets. Um, or endowments or that sort of thing. Uh, and I think on the, on the whole, what we see in our industries is things tend to get smoothed out. So you might have a real step change in the wider economy. And if you're in an advertising driven industry, if you're in events, you know, you see that, that get uh, responding very, very quickly to these economic factors. But it seems that R&D, given the length of the funding cycle, the length of time it takes the research to happen and then the write up that happens after that, we, we see very much as a smoothing out of the curve. Yeah, Dan, one thing I would like us to look at in the future, I don't know if people um, on this you know, webinar would be interested in this, but um, I've heard and, and seen just in reports but not read them in detail, that the other thing that happened after 2008 was that there was a definite shift in geographies around um, funding and, and publications. So I think it would be interesting. And you know, it, it's kind of um, some of the most interesting analysis that we're all going to be able to do unfortunately is probably two or three years away from now. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, to find predictive measures. And I think one of the things that just based on some of the comments you made, Dan, too, that we have to constantly consider is that this isn't all about data, all about observation, or all about intuition. It's about some combination of those yeah. things. Um, so for example, you know, one would say it's logical. It, it's logical that if you're an open access publisher with an a based on, you know, predominantly based on APCs, and that means that your sustainability is tied to throughput to some extent. And if that throughput is threatened, then your sustainability might be threatened. That is logical, but things don't just stay that way. So like, for example, a lot of the APC based publishers, even before this um, it, you know, before COVID, you know, COVID started really taking, you know, the, the, the grip it is on our daily existence that, that it is right now, they already were starting to look at models, you know, Rain Crow with subscribe to open and, and annual reviews, you know, that, that's an, a, a transition model. But, um, you know, Sarah Ruby from PLOS recently did a webinar on new models that we're starting to offer around collective action. And the whole idea is, subscriptions more stable it just is that doesn't mean it's not open but is there a way to somehow take that model and apply it to open access so that things stay open even when you have these fluctuations yeah. and i think also that gets us into some stuff that Anna and i've spoken about in the course of this is, is how this has a bearing on those big combined deals the sort of read and publish or publish and read deals however you want to term them you know if you have an element of subscribe to read and you're, you're looking to get overall multi-year deals put together, then naturally you can get people to subscribe to publish and, and start to, to back those open APC models into a more subscription-based model and try and get some of that like, like long-term stability into things. So of course, one, what, one of our sort of logical suppositions from all this is if you, especially the larger publishers, the ones that can offer sort of a very broad waterfront of subject coverage and business model coverage, you know, Logically, they probably stand to, to weather this downturn the least badly, if I might put it like that, of, of everyone else. I think it will have an impact um, because, you know, they've got the ability to um, to bring their open access APC offerings in, into an umbrella subscription model. So we, we are wondering if we might see a kind of an acceleration um, of, of any kind of subscription around open models as, as, as a result of this. 
Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, so uh, this is a, a little bit of a lengthy one. Uh, I think this is a fantastic question. So thank you to whoever posed it. Uh, so the question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the rapid increase of adoption and legitimacy in open research platforms and many, many researchers that are now circumventing traditional journals, preprints, protocols, and open data code? Uh, coupled with a growing public awareness and, and anger of the problems with traditional scholarly communications model, um, uh, it may not be fair, but people are now blaming our readiness to react to this on the closed, uh, slow, uh, not fair system. Will this create a new, new normal? So a lot to a lot to unpack there. But maybe to start with, with open research platforms and perhaps some 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 trends there. So actually, I'd like to start in a different spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I I think as, as context. No one can deny that everyone is looking at the research process and the research process itself has many different artifacts and, you know, milestones along the way. And it's at the end, you know, or after the end, actually, that an article is produced. So just logically, again, and I think you'll see that Dan and I are always going to sit back and start to think about process and logic versus, um, you know, emotion and preference. Uh, so logically, it seems that a lot's happening prior to the point where an article is even submitted, let alone published. So I personally can understand the idea of where and what in that stream is something that could and should get some kind of airtime openness. And then the, 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 the other part about that, though, is how do you then judge it's how do you then ensure that it's interpreted in the right context that wherever it is in the stage of research it's interpreted as being in that stage of research whatever peers and others are saying about the validity of methods and whatnot that that's also something that's that's understood so i i think that this is this is a really tough and and um and and multifaceted question because i i don't think especially if you think about open science, I don't think anybody, uh, well, anybody's strong. I think many people would say that there's benefit to opening up this process and to opening up more artifacts. And preprints is just one of them. That's just later actually in the process than some of the other artifacts that might be produced. Um, but the question is, how do we ensure that those results and those points and artifacts are, um, interpreted correctly. And then, you know, we can talk about fair and open too, you know, I, I, it's an interesting point to make too, because a lot of publishers then, whether they were mixed model, open publishers already were open or a subscription made a lot of their COVID content mm -hmm. open. But that doesn't really always get to the core, I think, of the question here, because it was not available until it was made open and all these things that happened along the way prior to that were not necessarily available or they were not necessarily able to be taken in context. I don't know, Dan, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things, Try. I mean, number one, the process we've seen has uh, shone a light on some of the kind of the, the pre-publication stuff. My first reaction when, when you heard about some of these initial preprints coming out and there's a real scramble amongst researchers to, to get information out about the virus. Uh, and I think it was very interesting the whole preprint mechanism even over the last year or two has hit a certain level of scale and maturity and so perhaps we wouldn't quite have had that that kind of preprint facility um i don't know back in the days of sars to the degree we had now um but the trouble is it the, the challenge with publishing is it takes time and we saw this with that french paper about the malaria drug you know yes it came out there was a, a scramble for it but of course now there's also a discussion about its methodology and of course all of that time around quality of peer review um needs to kick in now you know i don't know where that paper will land up i don't want to make any comments about the the inferences that are drawn from it i just want to make a point about there is a process that we have that does take time i think clearly the the role of preprints in a managed way has proven useful but how we then interpret those and how the wider um, sort of the world, the wider public, if you will, in, interprets those findings, I think is a, a discussion yet to be had because, you know, it's great to have some optimism and hope, but, you know, anybody who's been in scholarly publishing knows it, there's always caveats and ifs and buts in it and, and it's a complex process. So I, you know, I, I kind of hope that 
one of the silver linings of this cloud is, is maybe a greater awareness and, and a greater quality of discussion about these various options and we get more of a continuum in the process. Hey Dan, one thing that might be interesting to think about for us in the future is getting more to the root of this question too, what kind of data can we gather and look at the, about preprint, preprint volume, adoption, um, there's been lots of studies, you know, around things like, you know, do preprints ever get published? And I don't think that's really the point or the point of this question for sure. Um, you know, so maybe that's something we can start to think about some, you know, good data questions around that, that we can maybe do something with. And I think in general to, to everybody attending, if there are things you'd like us to investigate, if there are data questions that, that you have, even if they're not necessarily directly relevant here, please do let us know because we're always looking around for interesting and relevant things to look into. And I think, you know, this question could suggest an area that, that's worth doing that for. Absolutely. Okay. Um, just switching gears a little bit, thinking more kind of going uh, high level. Uh, we have a question from, you know, we have discussed a lot about the impact on revenues from, from subscriptions. However, how do you think this pandemic will impact societies kind of more holistically? What are, what are both of your thoughts there? So, Do you want me to go first? Sure. <laughs> I, I have a ton, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I, I mean, uh, my, my view is, again, to the logical, if, if you are a, especially a smaller society, you are highly dependent on a mix of revenue streams. You're going to have, you know, maybe perhaps your sort of keynote event, your, your big event, um, et cetera. I, I think things are going to be tough. And I've read general analyses, of, you know, about, about the sort of economy at large that says, through any of these sorts of crises, scale is quite important. You know, if organizations are big, have deep pockets, have uh, many different strings to their portfolios, of course they can weather the choppy waters better than smaller organizations that might suddenly find key revenue streams are just suddenly cut off and they don't have those deep, those deep reserves to fall back on. So I, you know, I, I, I do think um, the world could be quite challenging to societies. That said, and. So actually, um, I think this is a fascinating question. So I think in many ways, one of the things that's happening with COVID is it's accelerating things that were already in progress. So for example, um, you know, as part of Delta Think, before I started with PLOS, we worked with tons of societies and, um, you know, and, and they still do where, what is member value? What does that mean? So you have a society, where are you getting your money? Membership, uh, publishing, meetings, education, um, potentially grants and things of that nature. And it depends on who you are. So not every society obviously is created equal. You look at the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, there's this huge um, appeal to the public and another revenue stream that a lot of other societies wouldn't have. So publishing, one thing is clear, publishing is definitely under the gun. And this is something that could impact publishing. But I would say that the first thing this is gonna impact are our meetings and many of you and many of the societies out there have had to cancel their meetings. They've had to postpone their meetings that had to go virtual. Virtual meetings don't have the same amount of money, you know, that, that revenue for the society to help sustain itself. So it always comes back to why do you exist? What is the reason that your society exists? And what is the way you provide value to membership and to the ecosystem? So it may not even be membership, but to the ecosystem, the special the subspecialty, you know, for which, you know, you are a voice. And um, so I, I, I see where what COVID is going to do in a nutshell is it's accelerating trends that I believe many of which they were already there. You know, people already were overwhelmed with so many meetings. And yes, if, if, if you are the key meeting in your specialty, you're going to get there. But by the same token, there are, you know, there are specialties and subspecialties. So maybe I'm in a certain part of medicine, but then I'm also going to meetings that are very, very detailed. And, and I think that that was already starting to, to become under some pressure. And then finally, the other point I would make is that, so a lot of societies do on the publishing side, work with commercial publishers or others to try and, you know, band together to get scale, to get scale, not just in, um, cost management, but also in reach, in marketing, in recognition. Um, but I think that there's an opportunity for societies to start banding together as societies. Like I am shocked that we haven't seen consolidation along disciplines because I, I wonder, this is just me wondering out loud, not data-based, but 
you know, can we support the hyper specialization of a lot of societies that we have right now? I, I, I don't know the answer, but I would love to dig into that. And I suspect there are going to be areas where we can and areas where we can't. Excellent. Thank you. Um, kind of going off that, going back a little bit to, and um, we'll give you guys a chance to, 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 to breathe and, and, and take a sip of water. Um, going back a little bit to what we see in terms of funding um, and changes that that, 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 that might engender. Um, so if governments um, across the globe end up cutting research funding in a variety of ways that we know is a, is a possibility, um, how do you think that that will, will impact the market and specifically, you know, the scholarly market? I think it could be tough. So if, if you look at um, this GERD, growth expenditure on R&D, um, a lot of the measures are looking at the, the total R&D activity, typically country by country, if you go to sources like the OECD. Those R&D figures include both industry and academia. So what you need to do to get a handle on this is to break them out and say, okay, who's actually carrying out the R&D? Now, a lot, the bulk of bulk of it by value is of course carried out privately. Think of, you know, I don't know, oil exploration or car or semiconductor producers, you know, that sort of thing. But, but when we dive, so a, a lot of, there's a lot of research and development activity that's privately funded and privately carried out. The bit I think we're interested in for scholarly publishing is the stuff that's typically carried out in about, or by the higher education sector, so-called HERD, higher, ex, higher education expenditure research and development. And a, a significant proportion of that, um, top of my mind, I think 50 to 60% typically, is funded by government. So, of course, if governments start to cut funding, then I think it's going to be the higher education, the academic sector, that is going to be disproportionately affected by that. Commercial activities will be a sort of separate track, as it were. And it's really the, the bulk of papers that we're interested in are produced by the academic, the scholarly sector because typically industrial R&D doesn't generate papers, you know, if you think about, I don't know, figuring out a new semiconductor fabrication process, that doesn't necessarily lead to a whole raft, a raft of uh, sort of primary research and, and journal activity. So I think following that tortuous logic, if, if there's deep cuts made by government into R&D funding, it's likely to impact higher education. I think therefore we're going to see that wash through into the scholarly um, academic publishing sector in two ways. Number one, volumes of output will drop. So we're back to the, you know, the whole thing around the A and C model, but also ongoing cuts in library budgets. Uh, now, you know, li library budgets have suffered real turn cuts for over donkey's years. I think the data is fairly clear there. Um, so those budgets are already challenged. Now imagine they're being challenged further. And it may well be that librarians find themselves in a situation where however much they might want to renew a subscription, or put together a, a pool of funding for APCs, they just simply don't have the budgets unless their parent universities are, are prepared to sort of dip into alternative sources of funding. So I, I, I think that, I think if this continues and we do see deep significant um, government cuts, then there, there's going to be, there could well be tough times ahead. Follow-up question that just came in on submissions. Uh, what are you What are you hearing in terms of whether it's anecdotally or otherwise about uh, our submissions up, our submissions down? Is that something that's you know an effect of, of COVID? Is that going to continue in the future? What What do you think you see there? You know, again, I I can say from a hypothesis, you know, perspective. I don't I don't I don't know, Dan, if there's any specific data that would would point to this. But um, submissions, again, anecdotally, as I mentioned before, we're definitely seeing, a, a, and again, my unscientific sample of about a dozen publishers I've spoken with are definitely seeing increases. Um, again, some of the quality of those uh, is questionable. And also, publishers are doing some interesting things, which completely make sense right now, but they're even in the peer review process there. Um, worried about not asking for additional experiments and things like that, unless it really, really impacts the validity um, potential outcome of, of the experiment. So they're doing things to try to increase submissions and to try to get things through the pipeline. But as labs remain closed, I mean, so there's, there's research going on, obviously, in COVID. A lot of stuff's coming in. Um, for COVID, and we're hearing that uh, definitely throughout the, the um, organizations I spoke to that did have, that published that type of content. 
Um, and that's probably going to continue and be well funded for a reasonably long period of time. But I, I do believe that if this starts to last for another two, three, four months, there's going to have to be a point where submissions hit a lull as you know people regroup. Another thing I've heard anecdotally is um, early career researchers as they're starting their career and, and entering a time when they needed to get certain things done towards their, their graduation and to start their career, they might leave. They might leave research because um, of a limit of opportunities. So I, I do think that if this continues, I, I, I personally, again, this is just observation and logic, I don't see how we don't see an overall uh, dip. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's just that there physically won't be the people doing the work if this continues. Uh, and, and I think that that's inevitably going to have an effect. Dan, going back to a second for what you were saying about funding, uh, we have a question about uh, in your analysis, are you factoring in an acceleration of college closures, uh, particularly in the US? Um, obviously, many already pre COVID-19 were in financial trouble um, and perceived value is dropping. So how will this impact researchers, publishers and, and also buyers in the future? Um, so two parts. Short answer is no, we didn't. We were looking at the more, if you will, macroeconomic uh, measures, so sort of nationwide transnational measures of, of things like GERD and, and GDP. Um, I think in, in terms of that underlying trend, we've hinted at that, maybe spoke a little bit to it here. There seems just to be an un underlining trend in pricing pressure on subscriptions, yeah, but college closes, that whole sort of reduction in activity. Um, you know, I'm sure it's a whole different webinar as to what's causing that, you know, whether it's the, the hangover from austerity or, or, or other long term um, measures decline. Very interested to hear what, what people on the call might, might suggest there. Um, but, but certainly, I, I think there were long term trends in effect that um, this particular crisis um, will exacerbate or indeed might give a very temporary stay of execution to. So, Anne and I were actually talking um, just before the call about. Some institutions may finally dip into emergency funds, they might dip into endowments that were really only there to be used in extremists, and that might mean they, they can go, let's say, another year, uh, what was renewing subscriptions, for example, but that in actual fact, once the crisis is over, it may well be back to a sort of slow decline as normal. Um, so I think we, we're going to see a, a, maybe a mixed bag, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. There, there's obviously lots of systemic factors that were already in play before this hit us. Yeah, you know, I also think it's, it's kind of interesting to think, I know um, we've been reading lately about SUNY, New, uh, the New York system and a few other universities that have canceled their big deals. Again, another thing that was already starting to happen where this discussion of do we need this, don't we do that, need this, how does this fit in, what are our alternatives, et cetera, was already starting to happen. And one has to think that as budgets get more and more and more constrained, that those conversations are going to gain new and stronger legs potentially if um, universities start to feel as though they do have, um, uh, they do have other options. Dan, just really fast though, I think it might be helpful to talk just for a minute about what data that you're that is actually behind this particular analysis and what cut some of the challenges are finding data that you need. So, and just to as a precursor, um, you know, pretty much anybody that will listen, you know, I usually say, you know, channel from my education the George Box quote about, you know. Uh, all models are wrong and some are useful. And I, I, I say that over and over and over and over again because we never get to perfectly represent reality. It just, it doesn't happen. We don't, yeah. even when we're looking at correlations, we're looking at some simple models that quite frankly, you know, I don't know, somebody from, you know, Bloomberg with all these different indicators and access to credit card data and all this stuff could probably be doing, you know, a lot more of an exhaustive model. So we try to get guidance where we can and we try to do the best with what we have and we try to make it better by learning and continuing the process. But I don't know if you want to talk to that for a second, Dan. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I mean in terms of the models themselves, you know, the question of, about, for example, the, the lag, was there any lag um, sort of between the, the GERD and, and, and some of the results? It, it, there is a lag. Two lines will track each other perfectly, albeit maybe two years apart. And when you run these kind of statistical analyses, as we've done, 
the analysis would just tell you, well, well there's a good relationship there in lockstep. Um, and, and unless you see lots of wiggling up and down, you won't really necessarily see that the two don't correlate. Um, so yes, absolutely, there, there are limitations to what we, we can do when we're looking at these measures. To give you a quick sense of what we covered, um, on the one hand, publishing measures. So we were looking at numbers of journals, numbers of articles, both in general and open access. And then we also looked at stuff in the indexes. So typically in something like Symago or Scopus versus overall. So uh, we, we were looking for, for any sort of patterns there. I and mean, then in, in terms of the sort of um, data that might have a relationship with, with those, those uh, levels of output, uh, we were looking at a mix of things uh, from measures of GDP, gross domestic product, and, and then we, we then diced that by a number of different ways of looking at it. So to, um, number one, looking at year-on-year -year spend, but uh, if, if you get into this stuff, you, you need to make sure that you compare spend across different countries like for like. So we use something called PPP, Purchasing Power Parity, uh, and people like the World Bank and OECD done lots of terrific stuff figuring out that, out that, that kind of number. So you want to make sure that you're measuring that a dollar spent in one country buys you the same as a dollar spent in another and adjust for any sort of differences there. Um, but we also were careful to adjust for inflation. So there's a whole bunch of, of measures we, we, we use there. And then, then we looked at things like, would we measure sort of absolute spend, adjusting for PPP and inflation, but also year on year growth and, and changes in spend. And we did that for GDP, gross national income. So GDP is basically what you produce inside the country's borders. GNI adds what you might get from outside the country's borders. And anybody who's an expert on this, forgive my paraphrasing uh, awfully there for the benefit of time. Um, and then we also looked at uh, GERD, as I said, gross expen domestic expenditure on research and development, and things like GERD per capita. So we, we, we look for all sorts of different factors to, to see what has the strongest relationship, as well as looking at the personnel, numbers of researchers, numbers of researchers per million of population, and also looking at the numbers of researchers sort of researchers, researchers, as well as the, the overall number of people in research and development. So that's including technicians and ancillary staff. Uh, and then finally, in terms of the journals market, the data there is, is patchier. So we don't have years and years of data that you, you might get from sources like the OECD, for example. Um, and when you do look at journals market value, quite often the consultants is doing that work may restate that every so often as they update their model, that's fair enough. So when we were looking at market value, we actually um, sort of reduced it as it were to year on year growth. So we, we, when we sort of said there's that strong relationship between numbers of people and growth in value of the market, it's that year on year change in journals market value. We, we, we thought that was the fairest way of looking at, at year on year measures. Um, and then finally, just a brief word about problems getting the data. You need to go out to lots of different sources. I, I've mentioned things like adjusting for inflation and so forth, so making sure we're trying to track like for like where possible. And finally, not all data sources are complete for every year. So we, we just track things out over as many years as we can find and I'll look for those overall trends. So lots of detail there. Happy to follow up with people offline if they have more questions on that. Thanks, Dan. That's every, everything you were uh, wanted to know about data and were afraid to ask. We're afraid to ask. That's an <laughs> I wasn't uh, afraid. <laughs> uh, so uh, a, a number of questions coming in, which is fantastic. Please, please keep them coming. Um, and they don't also have to be questions. We welcome your experiences of what, what you're seeing at your publishers and societies as well. It would be fantastic. Um, but a, a question about uh, uh, big deals. Uh, so the say they say last week we saw three Elsevier big deals broken. Do you think that uh, as a result of COVID-19, libraries will be either further emboldened or will need to, uh, you know, uh, make break some of these deals uh, as as budgets are cut? Sure, and I think we started to touch on that already. Um, again, I think that that was already something that was happening. You know, you look at CDL and. You know, Norway, which ultimately came back and made a deal, um, Germany, you know, project deal. Um, so I think I, I, I personally believe that it will if, if, 
it, you know, financial stress and strain is that much more of a very legitimate reason. You know, you, you can get what you get. And if you have to save money, if you don't have the budget, that, you know, they're just like you and I personally with our own incomes would have to think about what we're doing. Of course, the libraries and, institu and, and universities are gonna have to do the same thing. So if we start to get into a situation where the school year is canceled next year, or, you know, only I've, I've heard things like, well, only students that are already in process would continue online, no new students. I, that has to come from somewhere. And um, it would be probably, uh, you know, very much, it wouldn't be very prudent to think it wouldn't come from publications. I think all, all the parents on the line just shuddered, Anne. <laughs> oh, I scared, so I, we had this thing yesterday on the PLOS <laughs> channels where there was this picture of this adorable squirrel and I decided we needed to caption it. And then there were these things posted about coronavirus and closing schools. I was like, I'm going back to captioning squirrels. <laughs> I just want to break away from this for a little while. Yeah. So, so that that was a great answer to um, you know looking at at big deals and subscriptions. So the flip side of that to you, Dan, um, what about open access adoption trends? The question is, do we think that OA adoption trends, so percentage of published articles, will accelerate, remain the same, or decline as a result of COVID nineteen? Uh, uh. So person says, I can see it being ar argued both ways and, and well, certainly. Well, I, that, that is the perfect analyst answer and I concur 100%. I mean, I, 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 mean, I think in general it's probably too soon to tell. Um, yes, given that there are trends that way anyway and also with subscription budgets being cut, yes, absolutely, that those could be accelerating factors for, for OA adoption. But I think there is a flip side on that as well, which is where is the money going to come from to pay however you want to structure it, whether it's a per APC or some other kind of combined deal fee, where is the money going to come from to pay for those publication fees? And just reference to the previous discussion point, of course, if, if schools and university budgets are really challenged, it doesn't just affect the library, it affects their R&D activities. And especially if they're not getting income from their undergraduate sources, which are often key uh, in revenue streams, they're seeing um, funds being cut from central government, then of course their R&D activities are going to take a hit and that in turn we, we, we could actually see a reduction in output both of article volume but then of course that, that might affect especially APC driven OA models. So I, I think there are genuine cases to say yes on the one hand this might accelerate things, it might accelerate discussions, people wanted to get content free of charge, but equally, there might be inhibiting factors that are just, just a brutal side effect of the, the economics that we're going to see. I mean, Anne, very interested in your, your views on this. Well, I, I think, well, what I think is interesting about this, and this goes back to a question that was posted a little bit earlier too, is that um, I do think that there is an argument be, out there where folks are saying, well, wait a second, you know, we're making all this COVID stuff free access. It's not necessarily open. And um, you know, there was a similar issue on a smaller scale, at least in, in many parts of the world, with Ebola. And um, there's starting to be this, this discussion about, you know, why isn't this open? Why aren't things, why aren't more things open all the time from the get-go? And then you get that with the discussion we were having about preprints. People look at preprints and well, preprints aren't always you know, vetted articles. They're not, they, they, they don't, they, they could be wonderful, but until they've gone through the process where peers have evaluated them, it's, it's hard to say. So, um, so I, I, I think one of the factors that might impact what becomes open access, believe it or not, are the transformative deals that are being signed. So um, the less friction that you give someone, so uh, assume there's less, just assume there's less, and there may not be, but just, just assume there's less to publish overall. Where is it going to go? And is it going to be open or not? I think that's going to be directly related to the amount of friction that's in the marketplace and how easy it is for an author to publish without necessarily having to worry about, does my grant fund this? Or it does my institution fund this? Do I have to pay for this out of my own pocket? And I think any friction that you can take out of the publication process, payment process, um, it's gonna help people yeah. that want to publish open access. And I think I, that's back to the um, sort of 
you know, the reduction in hyper niches, you know, tends to favor the larger organizations that can offer everything in one convenient one stop shop. Yeah. Yeah. What nature just announced after the plan S updates, um, on, uh, what was it on the eighth or so that nature was saying that, you know, Springer nature was saying that nature would even, um, potentially be compliant. That's huge because if you look at the drivers of publication, which is far beyond the scope of this call, but there's been a lot of research that Delta Think has done around this, that others have done around this, um, you know, like it or not, reputation, impact factor, they, they are still drivers for authors. So if you can get some of these larger, um, you know, impactful journals to at least entertain a hybrid model and have that in some kind of transformative agreement, I think that would be huge for open access. Yeah. And one other thing to add, um, it depends what you mean by open access. So yeah, I don't want to take sides in the debate, but, but people do use the term to mean different things. There is public access, which is free to read, but not necessarily free to reuse. The formal definition of open access, the Budapest Initiative, of course, says you need both. And it's got to be both free to uh, free of charge to read, also free of reuse restrictions, give or take accreditation. So, we, you know, we may well find that a move to making more stuff, quote, free does not necessarily mean it becomes more capital O, A, open access. Um, and I think that conversation will be set to- Oh yeah, we're not talking free here. We're talking text and data mineable, like oh, the, the whole the whole nine yards. Uh, and kind of going back to what you were saying about transactional problems related to access, uh, a good question from, from Burley, Bernie Folan um, related to access about why do we still not have seamless micropayments out in the market? It's a great question. Yeah, Bernie, I have no idea. Um, you know, you are, you are so correct too, because that's, I mean, that's one of the hardest things about um, APC publishing, you know, individual APC at a time when you don't have deals and arrangements with institutions is, you know, and then people, I've even heard, um, I've heard this before and it's just kind of, so, so the answer Bernie is, I have no idea. Um, but I can say that because of that, it is even an impediment to, to even like um, experimenting with submission charges or something. So if you look at, you know, how much a, a journal is bench rejecting or, um, you know, just basically, you know, rejecting without review, there's a lot of cost for people operating journals in that process. But there's really not a huge, you know, groundswell towards submission charges, um, even small ones. And part of the reason is if you have to go and, you know, go through the process for $1,500 or $2,000, do you really want to do it for 50 or 100? So um, it's a great question. I don't know. But my, my sense on the seamless micropayments is, is just a side effect of our very, very hyper siloized academic system. Every school or university wants to do things their own way. Different publishers have different models. There, you know, there is no standard. Some countries want centralized payments or some funders want centralized payments, others don't. So I just think the sheer complexity of the ecosystem makes it very, very hard for somebody to say, okay, I'll, I'll run a system. Why doesn't everybody come on board? The inevitable answer is, yeah, but we want to do it slightly differently. So I, I, you know, we may get there. I think it will just take a, a longer time than perhaps it's done in other industries where, where there's sort of more centralized um, payments or financing in place anyway. Uh, another question saying, uh, do you think schools will start to pivot to more uh, MOOC open models uh, more and more? Uh, will this call into question and say, you know, paying $80,000 for an online Stanford experience? Um, and could that then lead to the acceleration of microcrediting and credit stacking of higher education? Really interesting. That is a fascinating question. I'm yeah. definitely not an expert on higher education in any way, shape, or form. Um, it seems logical. I think one of the questions I saw, so if you see me looking to the right, I'm kind of scanning the questions too. Um, but, but it kind of related to a different question that I saw too about like, what is it that we're doing right now that might just impact the future permanently, even when things go back to normal? Like, I think there's general consensus that normal isn't going to be exactly what normal was six months ago. And I think this particular topic about you know, MOOCs and online education is is a huge factor. Um, 
you know, it, it was again, a trend. It was things, something that was going on at a moderate rate. I just finished a blended program. So it was part online and it was part in person. And, um, but what I learned as, you know, an old dog learning a new trick was that, you know, you could have great interaction, even online, even, you know, group projects, things like that. So I, I agree with you as, as folks, and I have two kids that are in the education process. One, well, I hope her, I hope she's my kid one day, my future daughter-in-law. She's getting a PhD and my son is um, a teacher in K through 12. And um, they're all like, everything is moving. I can't imagine we're going to lose all that. And that, I agree with you. I think that it's gonna call into question what should, just like it did with print, just like it did in publishing, it's gonna call into question, what is this cost? And why are we paying so much for it? If this is all digital, like it did in our industry, then you know why is it that it still costs so much? I'm not saying that that is a perfect or a good argument because many of the costs occur long before it ever got to that single point at the end for us where it became a PDF. But in a classroom, one could argue the same thing. Once it exists, how expensive is it to re-execute it even with you know new synchronous you know, professors helping the, the process along. I don't know, Dan, you I'm, have any Well, also, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an expert in education either. I want, I want to sort of speculate the, the, the bigger picture, but I, I wonder if this enforced period of everybody learning to use video conferencing, you know, some of us are used to it. We probably all had experiences with it, but it's now it's going to become such a part of our life. I wonder if that alone will help us get new habits acquired that might then open up some of these more digital delivery possibilities and make us realize, yeah, you, you can actually get meaningful work done and have meaningful interactions online, whereas previously, maybe even two or three years ago, the facilities were Dan, what if there's a residual fear of actual contact? Like, yeah. me, I'm sorry, I was teasing my husband today. I said, you know what, I was a hugger before, I'm going to be a hugger later. I'll be watching people to make sure they want to be hugged. But a lot of people, that's not how it's going to be for them. They're going to be like, you know what, I want to maintain my distance and I'm effective in video conferencing. So why should I be traveling? And why shouldn't I, you know, why shouldn't we have more meetings like this when, and, and build relationships this way? Yeah. So I want to uh, start the wrap up process by asking you each one, one final question. And uh, when we're going through all the, the webinar chat, uh, the, the, the uh, theme is that people are saying, um, you know, change, uh, which is a very Delta think like theme. Um, people saying, what, what do you think? Are we going to waste this opportunity to, to experience real change as an industry? Will things go back to normal or will there be profound effects that will be seen for some time? Uh, so to you both, what do you see as the single biggest effect coming out of this crisis? I'll, I'll stick my neck out and go first. <laughs> um, I, I think we're going to see an acceleration of consolidation. I, I, I think, as I said, if, if this is protracted and deep, we will see a reduction in market value. And I think the, the, the larger organizations that can bring together combined offerings, combined both, both the, the quote open access and also subscription access offerings, are logically in the in the best position to weather that. Sorry if that's not a, 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 a brilliantly optimistic outcome, but just sort of following the numbers on the chart. That, that's, that's my take on it. Over to you, Anne. Well, that's very difficult because I would have answered this completely differently. Like thinking, so I, I agree with you, but I mean, I'm thinking of it that this also just from a social perspective. And I think, I, I, as I started to say before, I, I do believe that there is going to be a change at, that lives on and how we interact with each other. And that change is a change we're gonna to bring to our business and our business are going to interact with each other in different ways. So I think that the, the trends that were already in process are going to accelerate and you add on to that economic issues. And um, I do think that while it's fair to say that large publishers have seen quote, price pressure before, I think it's gonna be nothing like the pressure that yeah. they're going to see in the next six months. Um, I, I think it, it's, it, it, they will wish for the pressure <laughs> that they had you know, last year. And so I do believe though that there's this banding together that they are, they're gonna be in the best position. One, I, one thing I hope, and I mentioned this before, I really do hope that societies um, start to cooperate and act together and um, for a greater good and the greater interest of their particular discipline 
Um, and that's really hard. I understand society governance structures are complex. I understand, you know, just some of the, the psyche around that. But I hope that we don't, um, that we come out of this and realize that truly certain areas, we are stronger together than we are apart, together than we are apart. That's a fantastic way to, to end our, our webinar. Thank you so much for that, Anne. We'll end on that, that note of hope. Um, I know for my part, I, I, I hope to see many of you in person <laughs> very soon. <laughs> uh, thank you so much uh, to Anne and Dan uh, for this wonderful conversation and to everyone who joined us today for so many great questions. Uh, we are going to make this webinar uh, available, the recording after this, if you want to revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Um, and we also really would love to keep the conversation going. So please Please feel free to email any of us with any questions that went unanswered or things that kind of come to you after the fact. Um, and, and we are planning to do this uh, again in the future. Uh, so hope you'll join us next time as well. So until then, uh, stay, stay uh, healthy and well. And uh, thanks again for joining. Thanks. Be healthy, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.